So, bidin viem. I see, I know. Uh, it is a title uh, of the text I prepared for today. Mm, but in the meantime, I changed it a bit during uh, previous lectures. Mm, so I will part to improvise. Uh, so, the words now and see in Polish as in many Slavic languages. Oh, yes. In, in Polish and uh, as in many Slavic languages and parts of uh, other Indo-European languages have a common origin, uh, many phraseological compounds and uh, similar sounds. Uh, this uh, coincidence will recur in my speech, uh, although it's not, it's only a peripheral, uh, it's peripheral to, to its kernel, which I intend to be specific instances of the cognitive functions of art. Mm. And so when we talk about art as a cognitive field and focus on its relationship to science, when we look at specific instances of art, uh, then I am reassured that the convergence holds, but only if we consider the sense of sight as a metaphor for the sum of all the senses. So not only the, the visual aspect of uh, knowledge of uh, seeing but the sum of the sciences of the senses uh, for the certainty of the recognition of reality emerges only when we experience an internal compatibility between <coughs> sensory experience and the processes of uh, superstructure speculation therefore i think Mm, that when we observe an excess of processes that are difficult to justify reflexively and disturb our sense of equilibrium, justice, or simply of striving to make things better, uh, we reach a state of feeling deeply inadequate resulting in an imperative needs to turn the tables. By observing the people and institutions involved in art, the activities both in art and on its periphery, in the space that connect art to the other areas of life, to other cognitive practices, I have learned many things, including, including at least a few that experience tells me differ markedly from the con conclusions that many authors of similar analysis I now draw, fr draw from the, their own experience. I want to base my argument on three such conclusions. The category of visual art or visual arts has lost its ability to describe the phenomena I am interested in. Art has been migrating from decades and has now definitively abandoned the, the systematics and taxonomy founded on the separation of the senses. Art is polysensorial. Administratively, binding taxonomies falsify the actual relationship between art and science. Artistic expression cannot be contained in a single successive member after the disciplines of science, the so-called science and art, and so on. And it is in fact parallel to it and similarly differentiated. The spheres of science and art are parallel and complementary to each other. Art is a broad category based on classificatory compromise. So the elements of this collection necessarily include both simple and complex, secondary duplicate 
reproductive, professional works and innovative, innovative exploratory, revealing, creative works. In ambitious exploratory art, I see an analogy with primary research. Primary research in science, of course. <coughs> and so, in, in principle, every case of art that genuinely intrigues me today, that I consider valuable, that is contemporary to us, I evaluate in the process of polysensory perception. The act of evaluation in, is, the act of evaluation is as, as much intuitive, instinctive, as it is based on the state of knowledge and through it verified and objectified. I highly appreciate artistic creations that draw on or refer to current scientific, scientific equipments or technological innovations. Scientific research also discreetly, indirectly, sometimes subconsciously, less often directly, is inspired by stimuli from the sphere of art. I don't believe, but I would argue that scientific and artistic experience don't stand side by side, but are parallel, like layers of one reality based on different components, layers characterized by different degree of autonomy. At the same time, I see that uh, in my reality, in my environment, the administration at institutions that manage the spheres of science and art don't see their essential relationship, ignore their achievements, specificity, arbitrarily impose on them an organizational system, taxonomy, rules of evaluation, financing, interfere its personal, personal policy. And they don't I, and they do this on behalf of the state, of course. Thus, regardless on, of my or our judgments and claims, the relationship between the sphere of art and the sphere of science is regulated by politicians. Such regulation allows little for mediation. It's rarely supported by, con rarely supported by consultation and is essentially violent in nature. From such a point of view, uh, when considering seriously curious cognitive challenges of art or methodological concepts, both those that concern the creative process itself and those which we introduce adepts to the current discourse of art, I move into the realm of fantasy and partisan improvisation or partisan-like improvisation, wanting to transfer the conclusions made in this sphere to reality, we are always forced to maneuver and compromise to strategy on the scale of a guerrilla. And there is nothing surprising about this. What is intriguing, however, is the scale and level of uh, complication of such endeavors as practiced teaches us the reconciling opposing vectors or factors can head to unintended and unexpected, unexpected consequences and above all its energy and all its energy consuming and time consuming. All the practices are energy consuming and time consuming. Uh, as it happens, uh, this time when I started thinking about attending our conference and making notes uh, for this, talk overlapped with two letter S. Uh, just a coincidence in time. Uh, 
First one, the preparations for the reception in Krakow, the artist Stellark, to whom our academy conferred an honorary doctorate this year. And in this procedure, I am both a climate and a laudator. Uh, and the reading of, it is th that first S, and the second one, reading of uh, Georg, uh, Georg Steiner. Oh. I'm trying to find a compromise between German and uh, English pronunciation of his name. Georg Steiner, Real Presences, a book that <laughs> fell into my hands during my summer travels. Just a coincidence, but it is interesting because both Mr. S are probably more different to each other than either of them share with me. Not only uh, they are from a different eras, they seem to have grown out of different worldview for formations. I have jotted down some quotes and comments for myself from the reading. So, some ex extracts of book uh, of uh, Georg Steiner. Mindless literature, art or music will not survive. Aesthetic creation is in the highest degree intelligent. And the second. Uh, the two concepts require reflection. One, on the one hand, scientific research in the humanities. On the other, the coexistence of the living arts with hermeneutics and the academy. So, third extract, or third citation. There are two reasons for the delusion, for the delusion, sorry the trivialization of the notion of research in the humanities and the dominance of parasitism in our culture. The first is the professionalization of academic inquiry and the appropriation of the liberal sciences. The second reason derives from the humanist imitation of the sciences. The humanities have been subjected to an enormous bureaucratic formalization aspiring to theoretical rigor and summary discoveries. And the last, the concept of research modified on the natural and mathematical sciences is flawed and humanists are deluded by its socio-economic success. Uh, that book uh, was published first time in, in 70s or 80s and uh, those texts was written earlier so uh, it is uh, just um, there are just reflections of uh, mid 20th century situation so now uh, i will present two extracts from uh, stellar a statement, who, uh, he prepared that statement for the opening of his exhibition. It will be open at next Monday. Uh, the exhibition and the text is entitled Hacking the Human. The body now experiences itself as invol involuntary, automated and absent to its own agency. The body is now remotely propelled and projected into remote spaces. Its awareness can be extruded and its physicality recedes. It becomes a, an extended operational system. It is the first citation, citation I know from his former texts, but uh, the second one is uh, maybe, it's maybe looking a bit newer. We continue to perform as biological bodies offline and phantom bodies online. Phantoms not as phantasmatic, but rather as phantom lamps. The self becomes situated beyond the skin and the body is emptied. 
But this emptiness is not an emptiness of lack, but rather a radical emptiness through ex excess. An emptiness from the extrusion and extrusion of its capabilities, its augmented sensory antenna, and its increasingly remote functioning. <coughs> In order to quickly bring this tangle of circumstances, insights, associations into the current reality, I will tell you a short, fictionalized, but fact-based story. I will use a metaphor of a garden, perhaps uh, a botanic garden. It might be the best metaphor for me. Although I, I would disclose it in advance that I am drawing facts from the academic sphere. Let me begin perhaps like this. So, it is just a tale, a story, a bit like for, for children maybe. There was a botanical garden with a long and glorious past. So, sounds like for, for children. But not very well functioning at present. Parts of the garden had been lying fallow for years, depri deprived of care and attention, while others were undergoing haphazard renovation limited by lack of funds. The garden has passed from one hand to the other. There have been better years, but no one has been able to chart a sustainable way out of the crisis. In spite of this, some of the beds and greenhouses ended up in the hands of enthusiasts, taken up by the idea of the garden and actively conducting experiments and intergarden cooperation. This, those developed uh, without much support from headquarters often did well and could provide a model for the repair or reformation of the entire garden. The relative autonomy of parts of the garden in relation to the whole, the general disorder prevailing in the garden, and the self-government of gardeners, which often by the law of inertia and out of self-preservation instinct, resisted in the authoritarian tendencies of the management, gave them the chance to function in this way. One day, a supra garden authority decided to reform and reorganize all gardens to better serve the common good. The idea of the common good required the introduction of a single evaluate, evaluation rule for all. And the single evaluation rule required a unified and more easily centrally controlled funding system and management structure. The powers of uh, directors were increased and the residual autonomy of garden self-governance and garden initiatives was, was uh, removed or diminished. <coughs> it deprived ambitious gardeners of the opportunity to directly seek support from, for the experiments outside the walls of the garden. Uh, directing subsidies and grant proce procedures into the hands of the directors. Finally, for the sake of greater efficiency, uh, there began to be interference in personal decisions in the appointment of senior gardeners and garden directors. In our garden, the oldest trees quickly disappeared, the paths were leveled, and the alleys were cleared of weeds and overgrowth. The bot botanical garden opened up to a wider, wider clientele and slowly began to resemble other recreational gardens and parks. Experimental enclaves 
changed hosts, experiments were limited to the vegetable garden area. The story is very simplistic, simplistic and ignores uh, the many processes and factors that degrade grassroots gardening and academic initiatives. It falls to mention an additional important factor that can dominate reform initiatives, the, the, ideological, the ideological one, ideological factor. Suppose, for example, that the specifics of our garden associate the supreme gardener with, for example, in vitro fertilization or with abortion up to the 12th week of rooting. I wonder if such an impressionically composed argument sufficiently explains the reason why I am not talking today about the methodological and cognitive aspects of the visual arts, but mostly about intermedia and polysensory art in a systemic aspect. If any doubts remain here, it is worth to remind, for example, the initiative almost half century old, um, which was created uh, almost half a century ago by Joseph Beuys, Heinrich Böll, Klaus Steck and others in Düsseldorf and later in Northern Ireland, the Free International University for Creativity and Interdisciplinary Research. And quoting Beuys' words. It is just a citation after life and works of Joseph Beuys a book published in the 70s. A free university wants to be an entity independent of the state, which has a say in the state affairs. It wants to be able to admit as many students as it wishes to enroll, and it wants to decide for itself who becomes a teacher and what curriculum is to be taught. Ambitious forms, curricula, and experimental methodology in the academic field are always threatened by standardization and the resulting inadequate evaluation. The university is threatened by the pressure of state institutions, political interests, changing social demands, and the demand for mediocre education meeting immediate needs. On the other hand, the university requires a freedom of research and autonomy that is, it cannot maintain without the support state bodies and institutions, of state bodies and institutions. Institutions that themselves pose a threat to the value they should uphold. In this respect, boys' ideas are fully in line with those <coughs> of, for example, Carl Jaspers. Both believe that it is the university that should shape the state, not the state that, shape, that should, sh should sh shape the university. I'm sorry. Uh, a view I dedicate in particular to the recently reigning reigning ministers of science and higher education, but also to the rectors of our universities. The free university is uh, conditioned for unleashing man's creative potential and for influencing the shape of the social relationship. For it, it is a repository and laboratory of experience and knowledge. The quality of the social form depends on the contract of governance of the common, uh, in this sense, the free university should uphold and generate the support of self-organization, of the processes of producing the social fabric, of giving form to the human collectivities. And thus, yeah, I think this is the last message uh, from my side today, we live in a constant tension between our biological condition and our aspirations in building research or teaching programs 
that are grounded in a good tradition and touch on living problems. We thus locate ourselves in the center of tensions and pressures between the pursuit of truth and kleptocracy. As scholars or artists, we discuss social sculpture, but as employees of the university of, or academy, we easily succumb to the pressure of national or political or economical interest or just economical or just economic blackmail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and insight of your reflections. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, is this metaphor of garden maybe here and also recently our high representative of the European Union in foreign affairs, uh, Mr. Borrell, mentioned that the European Union is like a garden in the world, and uh, some kind of jungle so outside. And well, how do you how do you think uh, always when we use some kind of metaphor about some border, we we expect that some, somewhere else where there is no such order is disorder. If the Europe is garden, so. What's outside the is walls? Uh, how do you comment your metaphor in the context of what metaphor used by? I think that it depends on the scale. Because, of course, uh, I think that I would be able to interpret that metaphor uh, in European, pan European scale, or generally, more general, global scale. But I must say that uh, I started to use that metaphor looking from the bottom, uh, from uh, our internal Polish situation. However, I think that it is not very separate of the rest of the world because we observe similar processes in between uh, economy, politics on the one side, those people who have that values we need to teach and to shape the society in their hands, and that people who represent that area I call university. I'm not thinking about, about particular university. I'm rather and that metaphor, uh, university represents uh, higher education, science, uh, scientists, artists, people who are practically trying to continue, uh, we must to generalize, who, who try to continue that civilization, civil, civilizational evolution and push it into the future. And it is a permanent conflict. Uh, and of course, the same nature of conflict we may observe in different countries or, for example, in the organizations like uh, European Union or other international, uh, on other international levels. But each needs a separate analysis. However, some conclusions will be common, I think. So uh, I'm not, my address is not uh, any particular politician, especially uh, in Brussels or another capital of uh, our unified structure. Um, I am rather trying to speak in the name <laughs> of people uh, who collaborate with me and who are obliged, and it is a kind of necessity, uh, to communicate with uh, uh, representatives of uh, administration, state administration, uh, ministries, and going further also other structures external to our inside situation. So it is, uh, I think that, uh, uh, I use that form of uh, story tale uh, just to 
uh, to accent that metaphorical aspect of th that speech. Uh, it is very deeply rooted in reality, in particular reality, but uh, I'm trying to generalize it a, a little bit. <coughs> because I have also an experience of similar tensions in many other countries, but uh, I'm rooted here. Thank you very much. Maybe one more short question, if we've got one. Uh, two, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. You use the concept of art in a very wide sense, a broad sense. And I wonder, um, can you pinpoint any practice from your point of view which is not a form of art? At the end of your talk, you you quoted Joseph Beuys, and he <laughs> indeed was defending the opinion that everybody is an artist. Do you agree with this opinion? Do you defend this opinion? Is that your opinion? Or can you say to me, who is not an artist? Uh, um, now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm laughing because uh, uh, I was answering from that question uh, half, one and a half year ago uh, during the uh, anniversary Boys 100th anniversary. There was a conference in Krakow organized by the students of uh, Faculty of Philosophy, I think. And uh, uh, during the discussions, somebody asked me almost the same question. Uh, because, of course, Boys uh, is well known of uh, several slogans. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's reduced to those slogans. And it is Quite funny because in '79, I took a part in a big international exhibition in Nuremberg. It was the first Jugend Triennale der Zeichnung or something like that. And there was also an exhibition of the masters. Uh, there was uh, Hackney, Boys, uh, Quintanilla, and some other artists of older generation. And by chance, I met boys at the office of that exhibition when I was coming back from France. And uh, I stopped uh, in Nuremberg just to ask for catalogs uh, from this exhibition. And somebody introduced me to Joseph Boyce, and we spent uh, about uh, 40 minutes drinking beer <laughs> behind the corner. And it was also a part of our conversation. <laughs> because he asked a lot about the uh, student situation in Poland, about uh, uh, the situation of uh, uh, younger artists in a communist state, and so on and so on. He had a kind of Polish complex uh, because of the Second World War. Uh, and he was speaking about that. It was a very nice and interesting uh, uh, conversation. I think that voice when he says that everybody is or might be an artist, it is unclear. Uh, of course, uh, we have a written uh, form of that slogan. He was trying to focus our attention on human creativity. So looking from the potential, I think that everybody might be potentially more creative than he is. And of course, uh, you told me that uh, I'm using very broad, uh, maybe not definition, but a kind of de description of art. I'm tired uh, of discussions, what is art and what is not. Because I know that uh, if we will compare all our opinions, we'll have an unbelievable huge collection of artworks or concepts about art. So. I agree that we must just accept a kind of compromise. It is a kind of database, a cloud. It, it, it might be also a metaphor of art. Uh, but of course, everybody of us respect only part of it. And if you ask me what, uh, what is art for me, uh, I will. I will give you absolutely different answer that uh, for the question what is art in general.
For me, it's obvious. But 